Hello, everyone. Welcome, welcome, welcome. This is an honor for us at Dillard University to host and present this event first on Black Panther Tales of Wakanda, edited by Jesse Holland and author Cherie Renee Thomas will conduct the discussion first, a little bit of history on Dillard University. Dillard University is the emerald campus of the great and unique city of New Orleans, the jewel of Gentilly neighborhoods. Nestled on the west side of Polyland, the area down Gentilly to the fairgrounds where the New Orleans Jazz and Heritage Festival explodes annually each spring. On the east side, we're bordered by Elysian Fields Avenue across the street from St. John Birchman's home for elderly black Creoles of the neighborhood, originally run by the Sisters of the Holy Family, a black Catholic order of nuns founded by the Honorable Henriette DeLille. Dillard University was born in 1869 out of the original land grants made to educate Negroes in the aftermath of enslavement with the support of the Missionary Association of the Congregational Church, now the United Church of Christ, and the Freedmen's Aid Society of the United Methodist Church, which coupled into straight university and union normal school, meaning a teacher's college originally. Later, they were renamed Straight College and New Orleans University. Out of that, out of New Orleans University came a secondary school named Gilbert Academy. The historic plaque resides still on St. Charles Avenue at the original site. Then Straight College operated a law department from 1874 to 1886. By 1889, New Orleans opened a medical department, including a school of pharmacy and a school of nursing. The medical department was named Flint Medical College. The affili affiliated hospital was named Sarah Goodrich Hospital and Nurse Training School. Even then, New Orleans was predominantly black and it was only at these Dillard University medical institutions could colored people be trained in the health professions or treated in a hospital. In those days, colored babies were born at home Dillard University became renowned throughout the region and colored folks came to New Orleans to be so educated. In 1930, New Orleans University and Strait College merged to form Dillard University. The trustees of the new school called a, for a co-educational interracial school serving predominantly African-American student body adhering to Christian principles and values. The university is named in honor of James Harley Dillard, a distinguished academician dedicated to educating Blacks. From the start, Dillard stood for the best in a city whose Creole traditions of excellence found a natural home. New Orleans and Dillard University welcoming the author, folklorist, and printer Marcus Christian, whose pioneering documentation of Black Creole culture laces the WPA Guide to New Orleans in the 1930s, and the popular novels of Lyle Saxon. In those, day, Dill, in those days, Dillard University and the Crescent City was home to great visual artist Elizabeth Catlett and to a young Margaret Walker, also educating the likes of Harold Batiste, Ellis Marcellus, and her hosting the early efforts of Irvin Mayfield's jazz compositions, such as Strange Fruit. Dillard and New Orleans, home to other legends in jazz, trombonist Maynard Chatter Chatters, composer Roger Dickerson, then artist in residence Sue Jane Smock, the first black woman to show at the Smithsonian, in concert choir masters, the great Moses Hogan and S. Carver Davenport, and too many others to name. With 150 years plus, of academic and artistic excellence to its name. Dillard University continues its historic commitment to excellence in education and its treasured placement in the most unique city in this nation, historic New Orleans, the birthplace of jazz, the home of haute cuisine from Creole soul food, second line parades, black Indians at Mardi Gras, social and pleasure clubs, centuries old, and so much good music and homegrown traditions that just makes folks happy. Former Dillard University president, Dr. Samuel Du Bois Cook often said, there's something about the genuine. 
which is so true and exemplifies our social, our successful graduates like Jericho Brown, Pulitzer Prize winner in 2020. Our current and seventh president, Dr. Walter M. Kimbrough, in the Hetchinger Report writes that today's HBCU students will benefit from communities that takes today's challenges and help them turn their pain into power to address today's concerns and those to come. In other words, he challenges our grads to become leaders of today and tomorrow. Dillard University in New Orleans, from its architecture to its history, but especially its people, is genuine. It's the real McCoy, in spite of modern life, cars, remember this is a city built before cars, life here is very good. And Dillard University is one of New Orleans treasures. Beneath Mardi Gras, beneath Jazz Fest, beneath all the partying, we are a faithful spiritual people in a city of families who make the culture. We came to these shores this way with a genuine regard for life, for each other, for God, for our traditions, for our cultures. Dillard University in New Orleans, we know that our faith has taken us this far for good reason. We are New Orleans. We are Dillard University in New Orleans. We are thankful and continue all that is excellent. The English program at Dillard University in the School of Humanities gives great thanks to Dr. Kim McMillan for bringing this event to us. The first book event for this historic publication at an HBCU at anywhere. Today, we at Dillard University are honored to host, welcome and present the authors published in Marvel's anthology of black prose, Black Panther Tales of Wakanda, edited by Jesse J. Holland. And now please welcome author Cherie Renee Thomas, who will conduct this evening's discussion. Welcome all of you and thank you. Well, applause. <laughs> thank you so much, Dr. Mona Lisa Saloy. So wonderful to see your beautiful face and to hear such a wonderful rendering of a tremendous history. Um, we all love New Orleans and we absolutely um, honor and respect Dillard University. Thank you for welcoming us. Uh, thank you, uh, Dr. Kim McMillan and thank you, Jesse J. Holland for um, creating this wonderful, wonderful book. We're gathered here today to celebrate the contributors, just a few of them. There are 18 short stories featured in the amazing collection, Black Panther. Oh, I've got my, my background up, so I'll see if I can ease it on on the screen. And if my authors, well, you can see it in, behind Jesse. Hello, Jesse, say something, Jesse, so your screen will come up to the front. Hey, everybody, this is what it looks like. Go get your copy now. <laughs> I'm in Mali, that's my background there. <laughs> All right. Um, and I just wanna say those early founders of uh, Dillard University and so many other HBCUs, I think of them also as Afrofuturists because they had to envision a future for themselves that didn't quite exist at the time. They had to imagine it before they could build it and conceive it. And that is just an amazing tradition that we are creating art um, in their footsteps. So Black Panther Tales of, the Wak of Wakanda, it's a groundbreaking anthology. Why is it groundbreaking? One is the, um, the culmination of a dream that Jesse J. Holland had. Um, he's gonna talk more about that. Um, it is also the first anthology of prose fiction to come out of uh, Marvel for the Black Panther. So this is not a um, ant anthology, anthology. <laughs> because Jesse J. Holland, of course, wrote the first novel um, that, um, of course, inspired that the wonderful film that we all know. Um, I just want to say that we have here today Linda D. Addison. Please say something when we when I say your name so that you'll come right up on the screen. Hello, say hello. hello. Greeting us from to be here Woo. from Arizona. <laughs> we have Danny and Daryl Jerry. Hello, everyone. How are you all? Great to be here. Greeting hey. us from Memphis. We have Kyoko M, best-selling author. Hi, everybody. Good to see you. Thanks for joining us. All right. We have Milton Davis, representing the ATL. Hey, y'all. What's up? <laughs> and we have Glenn Paris, also representing the ATL. <laughs> hey, how y'all doing? Hello, Dr. Paris. Hi. All right. So I'm going to introduce each by giving you a sample 
from the short stories and then we're gonna have our conversation from there. This is from Shadow Dreams by Linda D. Addison. Dira had never traveled so far from her village in her 14 years, except in her dreams. But this was no dream. She was on a train to the capital of Wakanda. As excited as she was about training to become Adora Milaje, as excited as she was about training, the village itself was excited, especially her parents and her sister. Dira was going to be everything she could hope it to be. She was going to make them happy and proud. More than anything, Dura wanted to make her grandmother proud. It was her passing that made Dura two weeks late to begin her training. Her mother had tried to get Dura to leave sooner, but once it was clear her grandmother wasn't getting better, Dura wouldn't leave her side. The last words from her grandmother were, be the best you can for Wakanda. Linda D. Addison, it's her short story. <laughs> and it's just an honor to be in any publication with Linda because Linda is in fact, a brand new grandmaster of poetry, joining Ray Bradbury and others as well. Just give you a little bit about Linda. She's the award-winning author of five collections, including How to Recognize a Demon Has Become Your Friend. And she is the very first African-American recipient of the Horror Writers Association's Bram Stoker Award. She has received the Horror Writers Association's Mentor of the Year Award, as well as the coveted Lifetime Achievement Award. Um, Linda has been a great mentor to myself and to so many other writers. She also um, is the editor of another groundbreaking collection, Sycorax's Daughters. Um, and she has a brand new poetry forthcoming in the magazine of fantasy and science fiction. So I'm just very excited. Um, but her story is amazing story and I cannot wait for you all to read it, okay? I'm going to introduce our next panelist by reading from his story as well. Um, Danian um, Daryl Dar uh, Jerry, is from Memphis, Tennessee, um, but his story takes us far away from Memphis and to another time and era. The story is called Of Rites and Passage. And it focuses on an entirely different Black Panther King. To swoon to hated the Patriot's clothing. The rough cotton itched his crouch, crouch in his back. He grumbled over the walking reed boats the patriots called shoes. <laughs> the hobnails poked his heels and he cursed the buckles fitted over his feet. You have a left foot and a right foot, Bass spoke into Swuntu's mind as she had since the day she saved his life and made him Wakanda's king. These shoes make both your feet the same. Two left feet, two right feet, who knows? The panther goddess had complained from the moment Tsuntu left Wakanda, searching for his nephew in Sekou. Now, the mystery of the story is who is in Sekou, and you have to read on to find out who exactly is this ancient uh, Black Panther king looking for in colonial America. All right. Thank you. That's Dan uh, Danian, Daryl, Jerry. I'm going to give you a little bit about him. He's a writer to watch. <laughs> He's a writer, a teacher, and an MC. They keep changing MC to musician. People, there's a difference between an MC and a musician. <laughs> a musician can be an MC, but a, a, a musician can be an MC. But it's uh, and an MC can sometimes be a musician, right? But most of the time, the MCs can do both, right? They can most most often do both. Well, not most musicians can be MCs, right? So I'm just gonna break that down. He holds a Master of Fine Arts and Creative Writing from the University of Memphis, where he teaches literature and English composition. He's a 2020 Vona Fellow or alum and a fiction editor of Obsidian Literature and Arts from the African Diaspora. Danian founded Neighborhood Heroes, which is a youth, or, um, youth arts program that employs comic books as a literacy aid. So he uses comics books to help encourage young people 
to love and enjoy language and the power of words and writing. He also teaches special needs students at the Bowie Reading and Learning Center. And he was a featured guest at the 2019 Mercedes-Benz um, South by Southwest Convention in Frankfurt, Germany. And he has his work as an MC <laughs> featured in this a Chicago race class and regional identity in the post South of uh, post soul South from University of North Carolina Press. He's also featured in the two volume Greenwood collection hip hop in America, a regional guide, as well as other publications. He's a writing specialist at Russ College has taught at Memphis College of Art and has new work in fireside fiction also forthcoming in the magazine of fantasy and science fiction as well. Damian, Daryl, Jerry, thank you. Okay. <laughs> now my next panelist I'm gonna introduce, I'm gonna read from her story. And I just want you to get a sense of just how broad the stories are in the collection. If you thought you were just gonna get one type of Black Panther story, then we've got a surprise for you because these writers have taken um, the canon and they have just pushed it further using their own imaginations to do that. This next story is Ukubamba. Hope I'm saying that right. Ukubamba. I remember a river in Peru had a similar name. <laughs> so, <laughs> I almost fell in that river, but that's a whole nother conversation. All right. And this is from Kyoko M. There is no honor among thieves. Okoye knew she had always known she had seen it for herself on the streets of Wakanda. She had seen it in the chaotic world outside their beloved city. She had seen how men were willing to betray each other, but most of all themselves for want of profit. She had seen what became of men like Ulysses Clow. It had stolen the life of King T'Challa, T'Chaka, excuse me. To her, there were few things on earth as low as a thief and King T'Challa knew it too. He stood facing the window in the throne room, hands folded behind his back, his posture perfect and straight as it should have been, for he was royalty. T'Challa had suffered greatly throughout his life. He had been asked to wear a heavy burden as king and the leader of Wakanda's tribes. Yet that burden did not show in how he stood, regal, steady, powerful. It's from Kyoko M the beginning of her wonderful tale. And just to give you a little information about her, um, of course, I don't have to tell her fans who already know that she's a USA Today best-selling oh author. Um, Kiyoko also describes herself as a fangirl and an avid book reader. She's the author of the Black Parade urban fantasy series and of Cinder and Bone, the science fiction series. Her debut novel, The Black Parade, has been positively reviewed by Publisher Wiki, and that's our trade publication um, for the publishing industry, the New York Times and USA Today. Um, she has been both a moderator and a panelist for various uh, comic book and science fiction conventions, like the massive Dragon Con, um, uh, uh, Geek Girl Con, Multiverse Con, which I went to, it was a great con. Um, I think they're having their second year. Um, uh, Momo Con, and as well as the state of black science fiction, which we're gonna learn more about from our next panelist. Um, she um, had a concentration in Greek mythology and Christian mythology, and I'm very interested to talk to her about that and how her um, background and her studies have influenced her writing um, as a best-selling author. Thank you, Kiyoko. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> so our next um, panelist and contributor is Milton Davis. Uh, Milton is an old friend of mine, and so I'm very happy to be in this book. We've been in a book together, though, before. We've been in um, the Black Tasticon anthology. Yeah, so we're going to, but I'm, he's going to tell you more about that. And I'm going to read a little bit from his story, which is called The Monsters of Mina Nagai. I hope I'm saying that right. Say it for me, Milton. You said it right. <laughs> all right, all right. I practice, but it's kind of like you don't know what's going to come out on the day of. <laughs> All right, the monsters of uh, Mina um, Ginagai. And that's on page 351. And when I tell you, when you get this book, when you get through reading it, if you don't feel like you've been all the way to Wakanda and back again, I don't know what else we can do for you. <laughs> because it is definitely a journey. 
Chief Gakure jumped from his bed, grabbing his shield and spear when the wailing began. His wife and children woke as well, startled by his actions. What is it? Njoke, his wife asked. Probably a Simba attacking the, her the, er the herd, Kukuri said. Njoki picked up her spear and shield as well. She turned to Gathu, their eldest son. Run to the village and get the others, she said. Tell them a Simba has come. Yes, mama, Gathu said. He grabbed his knife and fled the hut. Mukwami, watch your brother and sister, Gakuri said to their second eldest daughter. Do not leave the hut. Makumi nodded. Yes, Baba. Gakuri and Njoke hurried to the cattle pen. Together they had amassed one of the largest her herds in their village, if not the entire land. They were not about to lose their wealth to the hunger pains of a stray Simba. When they reached the pen, their anxiety increased. This was not the first time a hungry predator had invaded their holding, but there was something strange about the cattle's behavior. Gakuri expected to see the herd running about and pushing at the fence, but instead the bovine stood still as they wailed. They were almost to the gate when one of his largest bulls sailed through the air toward them. All right, thank you, Milton. Milton starts us off with some action, right? <laughs> um, just to give you a little bit about um, my friend Milton Davis. I could probably do it off the top of my head, but I don't want to miss any of his honors. He is a Black fantastic fiction writer and the owner of MV Media LLC, which is an amazing publishing company, I hope that you support it, that focuses and specializes in science fiction and fantasy based on the African diaspora, Africa and her diaspora. Um, its culture, its history, and its traditions. Um, he's the author of at least 19 novels. I think that, nov no, that number might have changed <laughs> between the printing of this book and today, right? Um, and I, my favorite book from him, of course, is the Griot Anthology, um, which is a sword and soul anthology, and also the young um, middle grade book, um, Amber, the Amber um, Tells, which are really wonderful. So he has works that are appropriate for readers from age eight to age 80, all right? Um, but he is a fine, fine writer himself. Um, and he uh, um, is a great support of another writer we love, Charles R. Saunders, um, and has in fact kept his work in print to this day. Um, his steampunk story, The Swarm, was nominated for the 2017 British Science Fiction Award. And of course, you can always find more about him at MiltonJDavis.com. Uh, Milton Davis, all right? So I'm going to um, introduce our next contributor by reading the beginning of his story. Um, and this is from Dr. Glenn Paris. And I like to add that doctor on there. <laughs> and um, he's keeping the tradition in the family because I do believe you just had the honor of, um, of passing on that coat, right? <laughs> to your daughter. So that is a wonderful thing. Um, his story is called The Underside of Darkness. I'm gonna read you the beginning of that. I feel like I can lift weights with this book. <laughs> <laughs> How does one describe blinding pain? For a fleeting eternity, Tequila's world had no color, no sound, no sensation at all. Reality invaded that timeless moment of bliss with definition as his right arm hung limp and numb. Flesh ripping torque in, um, exerted by the Jabari adversary had wrung the prince's shoulder like a chicken's neck. The arm lock wasn't sporting in ritual combat, but nor was it officially deemed illegal. The Panther clan's champion faced his third challenge of the day and he was losing. <laughs> so does he prevail? Does he make it through this battle? Well, Glenn is going to let you know. <laughs> it's not always easy being king, is it? <laughs> um, sometimes you have to give a, a bit of your own flesh, right? That's right. All right. Glenn Paris is the author of The Renaissance of Aspirin, his debut novel, Dragon's Heir, The Archaeologist's Tale, and the, the third novel, Unbitten, A Vampire Dream. So he writes in a number of genres. His short story, The Two Fairies, heads up the anthology, Where the Veil is Thin from Outland Entertainment. 
Um, as a board certified rheumatologist, Glenn Paris has practiced medicine in the Northeast Atlanta suburbs for over 30 years and now writes medical mysteries, science fiction fantasy, and historical fiction. Now I save our most adored one for last. <laughs> our editor, Jesse J. Holland. And I, I want to give him a big shout out only because I know what it's like to be an editor. And it's and, and as um, some of my other panels, as Milton knows, Linda knows what it's like as well. It's a lot of responsibility wearing that hat and shepherding the work of other voices. Um, at least a dozen, 20 something at a time, right? Um, and keeping up with all those different personalities and keeping them on schedule with their very, very busy lives. Jesse J. Holland not only shepherded this book into existence, but he also managed to carve out time to contribute to it as well. I mean, that to me is just tremendous and not a very common thing at all. So I'm going to read the beginning of his story and his story is called Faith, right? Because as an editor, and just as a writer, you have to have a great deal of faith <laughs> and you have to imagine the impossible and see it happen. Um, a lot of times before others can even conceive of it, right, Jesse? You have to convince them to have faith. <laughs> Weddings are always horrible. <laughs> the reception, however, T'Challa thought to himself, now those made it all worth it. Thumping music reverberated through the king's body as he sat back on his onyx throne and watched the cheering crowd throw themselves this way and that as a scantily clad Chantus sang what he had been assured was an appropriately popular music song. A wave of human generated heat rolled across him carrying the scene, the scent of expensive perfume, rich food, alcohol, and the wonderful aroma of living, breathing, joyous human beings. All right, where are these festivities taking place? Well, of course they're taking place in the Ifo Canhole Tempele, one of Wakanda's holiest sites. Um, we, in this story by Jesse J. Holland, we get to not only see the Panther King, but we get to luxuriate in some of the wealth and opulence and technology that is Wakanda, which of course, if it were a VR game, we'll be all in there, right? <laughs> So thank you so much. I'm going to tell you a little bit about Jesse J. Holland, who's extremely humble, because what I failed to mention is that every single weekend without fail, this gentleman journalist is on the news. He's on C-SPAN hosting. He's up before the chickens, right? <laughs> and you knows the news before we do. <laughs> it's just incredible. I don't know how you managed to do all that. And he's a father and a husband. Uh, uh, it's just outstanding. Um, he is the author, of course, of The Black Panther. Who is The Black Panther? Um, the first prose novel from this entire universe, right? Um, it was nominated for an NAACP Image Award in 2019. He is also the author of The Invisibles, the untold story of African-American slaves inside the White House, which was named as the 2017 Silver Medal Award winner in the US history um, in the Independent Publisher Book Award category. And it is one of the top history books of 2016 by smithsonian.com. He is the author of many other books, including Star Wars, The Force Awakens, um, Finn's Story, which is a young adult novel, and the nonfiction book, Black Men Built the Capitol discovering African-American history in and around Washington, D.C. And he's also writing on some great projects right now. I, can't, I don't know if you can talk about them um, a little bit. So we'll let him um, talk about that. <laughs> but he has won many distinguished honors as a journalist and, of course, um, continues to make history. Um, Jesse J. Holland, originally from Holly Springs in Memphis, Tennessee, now part of the Washington DC tri-state community. All right, thank you so hey, much. Thank Yay. you. I hope you enjoyed those opening stories, right? And that you want to get a sense to, of reading of what their, their different tones are. Um, we've got a young girl going to train, <laughs> you know, going to train, right? We've got stories about Okoye. We've got stories about 
you know, from the, the earliest Black Panther, from the very beginning, I think that's Milton's story. We've got colonial um, uh, Black Panther um, as well. Uh, we've got the contemporary Black Panther having to deal with some uh, um, some things at, at, the, at a wedding <laughs> that actually gets interrupted, I might add, <laughs> in the most dramatic way. Uh, he never stops being a king, right? Never stops being a king. Um, and my own story, which I didn't even mention, is the heart of a panther. Um, heart of a panther, which takes um, um, for us from Wakanda on a very devastating day um, for King T'Challa um, and leaves Shuri in charge, of course, um, and brings him all the way through Harlem to the Mississippi Delta to solve a very big problem. All right. So thank you. All right. So if my panelists could unmute yourselves. Woo! Because we got a lot to dig into, right? You got it. All right. One of the first okay. things I wanted to do, just because we're all here gathered under this big umbrella, which we call Afrofuturism, is you could talk a little bit about what that means to you, each of you, because I know that um, in our audience, we have um, people who are also Afrofuturists or claim, you know, or whatever the, the term you choose, where it's uh, Black speculative arts or African futurism, we are all working um, to um, shape and reshape the future, right? You know, so talk a little bit about that. Um, let me just start with Jesse. And how did I know you were going to do that? <laughs> so first of all, welcome everyone. This is not only the first Black Panther event for this book at a HBCU. This is the world debut event for this book anywhere. And I'm so honored that Dillard allowed us to come here and be the very first place we talk about these great issues around Black Panther Tales of Wakanda. Now, when you say Afrofuturism to me, what I think about is first redressing the wrongs that have been done to us by science fiction and fantasy for the past 150 to 200 years. Because if you've been following these genres at all, you realize that people of color, for some reason, over the last 200, 300 years, don't show up in the future. Or if they do, they're stuck down in the engine room. They're not in charge of anything. They're stuck down in the engine room or they're the security guard or no one actually asks their opinion about what's going on. Or they're the sidekick or the nerdy scientist left behind in service of the white protagonist story. For me, Afrofuturism is showing and telling the world that our stories are not only the stories of the past, but they're stories of the future, where we're not only going to be part of it, we're going to lead it. And we're going to show not only the world, but the universe who we are. Wonderful. Um, I think that's an extremely expansive definition as it should be, right? Um, we get so, um, we get a little triggered when you try to put us in a box, right? And the <laughs> person needs to be able to claim and rename themselves as they see fit, right? It's part of that self-determination, right? And it's very fitting to be having this conversation with Dillard University um, because if they didn't have that strength of character and faith, you know, to claim and reclaim of destiny for themselves, would they be here 150 years later? You know, it takes fortitude. And so that's why I'm always very careful to connect um, Afrofuturism to um, the past. It's not an unhealthy obsession with the past. It's a recognition, the, the concept of Sankofa, understanding that to understand where you are in the present moment and to be able to envision yourself into a different moment in the, in the future, you must understand the complexity of the history that has brought you to where you are, All right. Linda Addison, can you tell us a little bit more? You have been an Afrofuturist longer than I have been on this planet. And even though you don't look it, girl. <laughs> um, tell us a little bit about your journey. <laughs> I don't care about telling my age. As long as I'm, I'm, I'm here, I'm happy to be able to talk. Uh, 
I only had, I waved my hand before we got started and you finished because I just wanted to say how you are such a big part of why the world even knows I'm black because I, <laughs> I was getting published before you did Dark Matter One in the year 2000. You know, I was published all over the place, but nobody knew I was black. I actually had people call me after I was in it and like, oh my God, Linda, I know you were black. I was like, yeah, like, how would you really? You know? <laughs> You know, because I hadn't been doing the convention. So I just wanted to, I wanted to give you that because you're my hero. Uh, Asimov's and everything else you can think of, you yeah. know, and in space and time, just doing all the things. <laughs> but I mean, to me, Afrofuture um, ism or addicts or whatever you wanted to call us, <laughs> it's just, it's a matter of putting ourselves not just in the future, but seeing the hope of ourselves in the future. You know, seeing ourselves as fully developed, strong, smart human beings that, you know, we, I grew up with barely written by women, much less black, but I still wrote all the time because I wanted to see that, you know. So I created that when I didn't even have it as an example. What I think is so wonderful now at, at Dillard, and I saw, um, I read an article on um, the site that Kim, I think, has shared with us with some of the students. And to know now that there are people studying and becoming that is just astounding because that was something as a secret dream that I had growing up. I had nothing to show me that, but I had me in the mirror <laughs> and I knew it was, I wasn't white. So, you know, I think for, for, for the biggest part of it to me is hope. And, and, and also giving respect to the ancestors that have brought us here and saying to them, yes, we are going forward. We're going to, from here to 10,000 years forward, whatever we want to imagine and dream. All right, thank you. So just continuing on the, what is Afrofuturism to you? Um, I'm gonna follow that up, of course, with how did you dive into writing your story, right? For the um, Black Panther anthology. Um, so Danny, could you tell us a little bit about what Afrofuturism means to you? Um, for me, Afrofuturism is like um, the spirit of Black people and our tendency to always like reach for transcendence, right? To always like keep forward in the face of adversity. For me, Afros, Afrofuturism is kind of like Black people taking our philosophy, our technology, our culture, our, and our art, and using those things to make the world a better place. So it kind of reflects the future, but it reflects the present and the past. And um, only uh, one other thing I want to add to that is when I think about Afrofuturism, I, I go back like there are uh, all kinds of examples we can think of, but I like to think of uh, what's the old Negro spiritual swing low, sweet chariot, <laughs> right? This song about, you know, escaping from slavery, right? But it almost sounds like they're talking about a spaceship, right? Then you go from there and you go to the 70s, right? You got George Clinton on the stage, right? Oh, yeah. Lean down, sweet chariot, and let me ride. And he calls the mothership down. Go look on YouTube, George Clinton. I mean, Parliament Funkadelic, like in the 70s when he's young. They do the concert. It's a very famous thing. He calls the mothership down, right? Then you jump forward, right? And you have people sampling George Clinton, right? Um, Dr. Dre, you know, who is problematic, but like he uses this song, right? And uses it in a whole another way, right? And he uses machines to sample it and take it and do something totally different. Sampling machines that were actually made to emulate what black DJs we're doing in the 70s. So when I think about Afrofuturism, that's what I think about how our creativity goes from like past, present, and future, but not just in that linear way, like back and forth, you know, all kinds of ways. All right. That's my all right. That's fantastic. I mean, um, first of all, that uh that performance piece, that art piece is in the Smithsonian Museum yeah. right now, right? It was rescued mm -hmm. from, a, uh, from a heap somewhere and they mm -hmm. uh, put it back together and it's in a museum. So definitely George mm -hmm. Clinton co-hosted Cosmic Slop, which is a mm -hmm. film adaptation of, of several stories, including Derek Bell's, uh, the Space Trader science fiction story that I was honored to reprint in Dark Matter. Um, it's just really wonderful that you made that connection there of, of how um, 
you know, all of these threads have been picked up by artists over time. Um, definitely. And of course, um, I think of like people like Colwell Eshoon, a Black British uh, filmmaker who talked about, and, and excuse me, uh, John Okompra, who talked about um, the Middle Passage and the transatlantic slave as being like a, um, a first contact uh, experience for us in the diaspora um, in, um, in particular. So, um, you know, wherever we were dropped off in the world, right, um, as a first contact story. So that's just wonderful. Thank you. Kyoko, Afrofuturism. <laughs> um, so, so when I hear the term, um, I think of a little bit of what Jesse mentioned when he when he gave his answer, which was it, it's almost like it's correcting a misconception, especially with uh, African and Black cultures in particular, where, like he said, we've been completely overlooked for almost the entire length of of when literature was established, um, and and been you know, pushed to the side, giving small roles, given insulting roles, different things like that. When in fact, I mean, the culture has always been writing science fiction, been writing fantasy, been imagining ourselves in situations just as fantastic as our white counterparts. And so to me, Afrofuturism is, it, it's not an offshoot, it's not derivative, it's what has always been here, being recognized in that fashion. It's seeing the world through the lens of people of color, particularly African and Black creators, um, and allowing us to tell those stories without censorship or without having to be adjusted to fit the palette of whatever is popular or the people who are in control of, of uh, you know, popular literature at large. Oh, you're, you're still muted myself afterwards um i have a very loud chirpy cat so when she when you guys oh. when you guys get lively she gets lively with you <laughs> i was gonna say my, my cat is very social she's probably now i'm up on my table so you won't see her but like every time i've had a zoom meeting she's like oh my god there's people you're talking introduce me yeah but i'm like but nobody's talking to you girl go back over there mm -hmm. <laughs> but yeah so it's um it's an ever-present thing um you know, this, this idea of, you know, us using technology. I know that um, scholar Alondra Nelson, who's now um, on the presidential uh, science team, one of the early Afrofuturists in the 90s who did the Afrofuturism.net listserv and also did um, a great um, edition of social text where she was talking about um, how black artists um, around the world actually were using this, this tool, um, this theoretical tool, a creative tool of Afrofuturism as a lens to create new work, right? And to talk about their existence in the present because that's what all speculative fiction does, right? It asks the question, what if, right? What if this happens? What if that happens? And it may seem like it's the near future or far away world but it's really com commenting on today, right? Thinking of Octavia Butler's book and how Tepera of the Soil ran back up on the, on the bestsellers list, right? Because it seems so prescient, but she was actually just talking about 1980s, <laughs> 1990s America, right? Um, so yes, um, Milton Davis, what does Afrofuturism mean to you, sir? Uh, that's an interesting question. <laughs> um, <laughs> I, I had to grow into the term. Um, I remember, um, a few years ago, I was at a uh, presentation at our uh, Auburn Avenue Research Library with uh, John Jennings and uh, Stacy Robinson, and they were doing a presentation on Black Kirby, which was basically his um, Afrocentric interpretations of, J of Jack Kirby's thing. And we were talking about Afrofuturism. And at the time, I asked the question, I was like, well, do we have any Afrofuturistic um, literary references? And everybody was kind of quiet, you know, and we talked about different things that could relate to it. Um, and but as we've gone on and come to this point, it seems like the definition has kind of like grown to encompass and cover what we do as black people in the creative and speculative fiction. Um, I'm kind of a technical person. I see Afrofuturism as covering one aspect of what I do, which is when I imagine the future from an Afrocentric perspective. Um, I see, I, I guess the word future catches me all the time. <laughs> so I see some of the things I write like cyberpunk and, um, and different things like that as being part of Afrofuturism. So I think now the term is a blanket term that really just covers what we do in a spectral aspect. Um, again, a positive aspect of what we do, being in the center of this uh, imaginative space as far as, as, instead of being on the side of it and us creating the future for ourselves and, um, and, and, and showing people what that would look like. And, and like you say, going beyond just being the sidekick, but being actually the, the, the fulcrum and the center of this imagination. And that's what makes it so exciting. 
Glenn. Hey, how hey. you doing? <laughs> Been a big fan for a long time. Love dark matters. No S, dark matter. <laughs> no, no S, sorry. No. <laughs> uh, so Afrofuturism to me is, is part of life. So um, I got to give um, uh, big ups to Dillard University when my son started uh, after uh, high school. Uh, he's now a computer scientist. So there you are, Afrofuturism. <laughs> uh, but, uh, you know, it's where we, where we are going and where we are uh, started hundreds of years ago, thousands of years ago. And that's the way I write. I write as if it's a continuum. You know, uh, in, um, in our story here, T'Challa wasn't the first Black Panther and he wasn't the first one to face a crisis that uh, had worldwide um, uh, consequences. Um, but Afrofuturism is really, you know, looking through um, the lens at uh, events of the past that are fantastic, events of the present that are fantastic, or events in the future that are fantastic, but looking through the lens of those of us who survived the diaspora. Can you because tell us? That, oh, go ahead. Go ahead. No, ask the question. Sorry. Oh, I just wanted to, um, if you could tell us a little bit how you use your medical practice or any, or if you use your medical field in any way to inform your um, speculative writing that you do. Oh, well. always, always. So uh, even in um, the, uh, the underside of darkness, I talk about the injury that um, uh, Tequila uh, incurs um, in, in terms of the anatomy of his shoulder. So I, I always throw in some medicine whenever I do that or, or some uh, science, whether it's um, astrophysics, uh, chemistry, biology, whatever it is, um, you know, that's my background that goes back to childhood. I've always been there. Um, and one of the things I guess that's been an advantage for me is just my na naivete. I didn't know that black folks didn't write science fiction. So I wrote science fiction. You know, I didn't know that they didn't write drama, so I wrote drama. Um, but I, I wrote what I like to see, but I wrote it the way I saw it since I was a kid. And uh, that's, that's helped me. Um, I went to college at Fordham University in the Bronx, um, and I took uh, African history. And I've loved, you know, some of the legends, some of the history. I incorporate that into um, my science fiction. I incorporate that into some of my um, medical fiction. Um, uh, if you read um, Dragon's Air, coming out from Outland Entertainment, I think this spring, uh, but there it's loaded with um, little tidbits of African history, uh, African mythology, uh, and um, even ancient history, going back to Mwene Maputo. So, you know, a lot of that is incorporated in there. If, if you're very knowledgeable about um, African history, you know, for example, knowing that Egypt was once called Kemet. You know, you'll pick it up from the first chapter, but you know they're very subtle, but they're woven into the story. All right. Uh, you know, okay, I'm gonna get back to you. I'm get back to you, Glenn. Yeah, that's fine, back that's to you. <laughs> All these, all these writers are so interested. I want to, I want to leave anyone out, but we're gonna get back to you and your, um, your historical research because I think you and Milton have some very similar approaches to the way that you approach storytelling. Um, it's like, you know, coming in with your, your research hat on it. And I know that Linda and Jesse does as well. Jesse, why are you muted, sir? Why are you muted, sir? Because I have children that keep <laughs> running through the room. This is Zoom. <laughs> They're like, daddy. <laughs> so I um, want to ask you, this is gonna be our rapid fire round. So we're gonna, I'm gonna try to move it in, move it in, move it out, all right? All right. All right, we're gonna move it in. Name, um, name one thing that you that was absolutely necessary as you wrote your individual story. Tell us the story title again, and one thing that was absolutely necessary for you to write that story, whether it was something physical around you or some element or some kind of research to help inform you as you were writing that story. I know it's I know I'm throwing it on you, but that's the best way to get the juice from you. <laughs> <laughs> Jesse, on oh, three. me yes. again? All yes. right, okay. So <laughs> the thing that I always have to have, and especially when I was writing the story Fate, is music. I write to music. So for the first time out of everything I've ever written, I listen to gospel music wow. to write this story because I wanted to have a specific 
frame of mind for the tale I wanted to tell, which is about religion and why you believe. So mm -hmm. that's at the core what this story was about. And I grew up in a small town, about 40 miles outside of Memphis, going to a church that did not have air conditioning until I was in high school. <laughs> so I had to put myself back in the frame of why you believe. That's and so I listened to gospel music the whole way through. Yeah, you need that in particular when you're building a story around the Black Panther, because people might forget that Wakanda is, is, a, is, a, is a nation that is built on faith, the faith and their belief in the, in the Panther goddess, right? And right. The, in, the black, in, the, in the Black King, uh, the Black Panther King, and it's all woven together. So um, that's really important. Uh, Kyoko, can you tell us a little bit what, what was the one thing you needed to write your story? So uh, once again, my story is called Ukubamba. And um, I think for this particular one, when I was given the uh, opportunity after I stopped screaming in excitement, of course, <laughs> um, <laughs> was I went and because I, I knew as soon as I was given the parameters for it, um, he gave me a whole choice of different people I could write. And I was like, it's gotta be Okoye because she was my absolute favorite from uh, the entire roster of great characters in the Black Panther movie. But what I did in particular is to kind of get in the mindset uh, is I think I went and watched um, a couple of her, of her scenes from um, the different things that she's been in. Um, there's that scene like where, where um, what's his name? Ross puts his hand on T'Challa's shoulder and she gives him that look and she's like, if he touches you again, I'm pinning him to this table with this spear. And I was like, yes, that will get me in the mood to write <laughs> Okoye. <laughs> so to me, that was the, the one vital thing to get her voice to kind of get like, a nice summary of what she is, even though, again, I, I acknowledge the difference between, you know, the movie and the comics. And, and I did some, some research on the comics as well. But that was what I needed to like grip, you know, what I was going to go tackle in this particular story. Yeah, because you're writing a story, you got to conjure that emotion on the page. You got to be mm -hmm. in the mood yourself. So some of us are, what it, method, they talk about method actors. Some people are method writers. Right? <laughs> you got to relive it a little bit. Uh, Danian, tell us a little bit of what is the one thing you needed to write your short story? Oh, tell us uh, the name of it again. Remind us the name of the story. Oh, okay. Well, the name of the story of my story is of rites and passage, of rites and passage. And I think like the one thing, cause I needed several things. Um, <laughs> but one thing that I needed really um, was that big, Marvel Universe handbook. And because I've been reading Marvel comics right since I was a kid, right? But I still needed to go back and I was like, I needed to remind myself of some of those threads. And not even just for my own story, but just to get myself like, you know, all the way like in the in the Marvel multiverse. Right. So I definitely went back and you know I I I I, I um I read up on my Marvel um, history, you know, I already, I already, I already knew it, but I didn't want to trust what I already knew. So I went back and did some research. All right. <laughs> One of the things <laughs> I needed was the map. I kept struggling. I was like, this is the only yeah. map I got. Yeah. They need better maps. I want a whole book of maps of Wakanda. Okay, yeah. Marvel, somebody make a book of maps. <laughs> I think that would be like a visual map of Wakanda would be amazing. I needed the maps. <laughs> um, Linda. <laughs> I don't even know why you asked for one thing. <laughs> okay. One thing. When um, uh, I also was jumping up and down and, and kind of crazy at the concept of even playing with this, but I was totally drawn to the uh, warrior women. That was about it. So I did a lot of research. I read all the old comics because I wanted to make sure I was coming with that vibe and not the movie. Um, I read and watched, I found everything I could on the West African women um, warriors, Dahomey, if I'm saying that right. Um, everything really came from me, never having been trained as a, a warrior woman, wanting to be. So <laughs> what would that be like? And every single thing in that uh, story, which is called Shadow Dreams, um, is something that I had to go and look up because I wanted it all to be very true. I'm very nonfiction um, um, connected. So if she's running, if she's using weapons, whatever they're doing, I looked up, read about it, watched video. <laughs> so I don't think I could have lived without the computer and Wi-Fi. I'm just saying. 
<laughs> yeah, no, thank you for saying the canon because that was one of the one of the rules that we had. One of the guides that our our dear leader uh, Jesse gave us. He's like, I know you love the movie, but you're not writing the movie. <laughs> You are drawing from the canon from the 1960s onward, you know, and all the different threads. So well, one of the things I had to write the uh, family tree and then start erasing things that hadn't yet been a part of the what the current comics hadn't got up to yet. So I had to cut things out that um, that were part of the uh, original canon. But yeah, definitely. <laughs> Glenn. Well, for me, if I'm going to write something, it's got to be personal. So I got to write about personal relationships, in this case, romance and uh, loss and sacrifice. So, you know, you, you can have a, a regal character, but he's got to experience some loss and sometimes not just death. Uh, I completely bypassed canon and Jesse, Jesse I, I'm sure I want to cut my throat many a times. I wrote my story so early. He hadn't even, I, look at him now. He, he hadn't even given me parameters yet. I, I sent the story in and he's like, he kind of sat on it for a while and thought about it. It's like, oh, oh what the heck? <laughs> <You know? laughs> but uh, yeah, I got to have personal um, uh, relationships in the story. Mm -hmm. And it just builds around that. That personal connection goes yeah, back to yeah. like why we write stories in the first place, right? Yeah. But most of them, I just made it up. <laughs> Milton, what is the one thing you needed? to write your short story for the anthology. Well, I'm like everybody else. And Jesse gave us the parameters. I did the research. And the one thing that popped out for me was Bashinga and, um, and his and the origin story. And it was actually a particular um, series of like three um, books that talked about him. But T'Challa talked about him briefly and, and not in detail. And when I started reading about him, the second thing that came up in my, to mind, and I'm going to nerd out, nerd out on you guys. Now, I'm a history nerd. I love history stuff. Um, I have this book called a Dewan, and the Dewan is actually an oral history of the the leaders of K of the Kano Bornu Empire in Nigeria, um, the Safawa clan, and it goes and it's over, almost seven hundred years of a history of this uh, lineage, and that's what I thought about, and I was thinking about what would be the how would the first person who created a lineage that went on for hundreds and thousands of years, you know, what would be the story behind that, and that's what you know. I had that book beside me the entire time, looking at the different um, explanations of people like that. I said, but this is what I want this story to be. I wanted this, wanted to be the origin of the Black Panthers, something similar to what I saw in the Dewan. All right, excellent. So I have two questions for you all. Um, one of the questions are, are um, as writers, um, if this is someone who's a new writer, um, they wanted to talk a little bit about how do you how do you distinguish your work from all the other works that are out there? Like they're new, they have something they want people to read. How do you let people, how do you get people to read it and pay attention to your story um, when they have so many other things they can do? Um, so how do you approach that as um, writers? And then the other question that I have is there are people who are commenting about um, what it means to be, you know, to find your tribe, right? To find that community who loves science fiction. They're also part of your culture. So you don't have to do a lot of translating all the time and they get you. Um, can you talk a little bit about what it means to be a blurred? I guess that's what we call a black nerd <laughs> <laughs> or someone who's just, you know, who loves science fiction and you don't have to, you're, and you're not unaf unafraid to talk about it and to explore that. I remember as a coming of age when it was not cool at all, at all to be a part of, of Dungeons and Dragon, Magic Hearts, any of that, like it was just, it just wasn't a, a public mainstream thing. Now I feel like all of this wonderful um, community, it's mainstream now, right? It's a part of the larger culture, but it definitely was not always the case. So can you all talk a little bit about that? Mm -hmm. well, um, I mean, I'll yeah. jump in if nobody else wants to, cause you know, I always jump in when nobody else wants to. <laughs> all right, so here's the thing. I mean, I was also one of those little skinny, big Coke bottle glasses, uh, blurred. We didn't even. Go, I was just a nerd and a dork in high school. <laughs> I, wasn't, I, I didn't even get the blurred title. Yeah, uh, but, cool. <laughs> but the thing is, uh, when you love something, it doesn't matter what anybody else says. So I found out early who I was. Uh, no matter what else you ever see me do in my life, you will realize that I'm a writer. That's what I do. No matter what else it is, I'm going to be somewhere writing in it. 
even that's why you see this whole book of stories. There was absolutely no way this was going to be put out without me writing something. <laughs> I'm going to write something because that's who and what I am. Uh, I come from a, a big tradition of, of uh, blurs. Um, you know, my high school, Bronx High School of Science, New York, um, that uh, spawned, of course, uh, Samuel Chip Delaney, um, Neil deGrasse Tyson, John Favreau, uh, you know, all my peeps from uh, Bronx High School of Science. You know, it's just what we did. Um, but, you know, we had all kinds of Star Trek um, uh, clubs and, uh, you know, astrophysics clubs, astronomy clubs. You know, it, it's, you know, we, we were all nerds, just like this army of nerds, you know, going to school every day and, and learning, um, you know, um, science, high level math, uh, computers back in the 70s when computers weren't a thing yet. So you know, I, always, I already started to, you know, hit the ground running by having that uh, background. And then, you know, I just started making up stories and, you know, finally I decided I need to write some of them down. I can go next to, um, first of all, Glenn, my son graduated from Bronx Science. All right. <laughs> you know, it's all cool. Um, I probably am the oldest one here. So <laughs> I was writing, you know, I don't care. I'm just saying I was writing weird stuff back when Angela Davis and Black Power was happening. And, you know, I grew up in a poor neighborhood and everybody was like, why are you writing that instead of political racism stuff? And I was like, in my head now, I can say, well, that was kind of political <laughs> to write weird stuff with Black people in it, but okay. So um, I was kind of just wired like that. I always wrote weird stuff. I couldn't even not do it. And I'd always read everything that, that had to do with it too. There was no such thing as blurred. I was just an awkward, skinny, weird kid in the corner that didn't talk and read everything. So <laughs> later on, when I when the blurred came into existence, I was like, "That's much cooler than the awkward, quiet kid in the corner reading all the <laughs> everything that they could find." Um, did you want us to talk about the um, part of how to write and, and yep. okay. yes, the part about how do you how do you bring attention to your work? I, um, yep. I wanted to say because I mentor a lot of young writers, and I don't mean young in age, but in publication. I always push them to write not for um, a publication, not for what's hot and thing, but what is coming through them emotionally. What is their fears? What is their loves? What are they pissed off about? And I don't ask them to give it to me. I need them to get it out, put it down, and then they can decide later on whether they want to turn that into a story, into something. But that's where you distinguish yourself from everyone else by getting in touch with that authentic emotion and drive and, and, and imagination and fear in yourself. Then you learn all the other stuff, right? You learn the grammar, you learn where to mark it's all, but it has to, has to start to me with your authentic drive inside of you, what you know what really gets you going and what pisses you off. Well, I, uh, I like to piggyback on that a little bit. Um, with some advice that I was given in a, in a writing workshop. And basically I was told that um, to listen to my own voice in the sense that it is much easier for me to write in my voice than to try to write in a voice that I think sounds like science fiction or that I think is sounds literary or whatever. Um, basically, your story is original because you are original. So as long as you're being yourself, your voice will have a place in the world. Um, a good thing, I, I, um, I was also told this, like record yourself talking, or at least like when you tell a story, think about how you tell a story to just a friend when something cool happens and write like that. Try to, try to take your storytelling voice that you use in life and put that on the page and work with it you know, and get it up to snuff, I guess, for lack of a better term. Um, for the second part, I would say this. I have a philosophy. I say, or really it's a theory, and my theory is that Black people made being a nerd cool. And, you know, I believe that I feel as though I was one of those original nerds in the <laughs> 80s playing those first computer games on the big floppy disk, right? 
playing Dungeons and Dragons. I got stuffed in the lockers so that the nerds now, right, can live better lives, right? <laughs> <laughs> Okay, you're on your own with the stuff to the locker door, man. You're on your own with that one. Can you dance though. That's Can my. That, that's, yeah, I'm like, yeah, I'm, I'm like the, a freedom fighter. Okay. Right. <laughs> We're gonna open it up. I know that I, I believe the um, the original question was also also about marketing stuff. They want to know, like, if you're on the Amazon site and you've self-published, how do you, how do you, just, you know, get your work out there? Um, for those of you who are marketing mavens, I'm looking at you, Linda. I'm looking at you, Milton. Looking at you, Jesse. Uh, <laughs> um, so they will know about that. But we want to open it up in case people want to unmute themselves or actually want to raise your hand. Use the um, the reaction function. I'm going to put mine up so you'll see. Boom. I, well, maybe that's not the right one, but that's the one I'm going to use um, to let us know if you have a question. You can unmute yourself um, to ask the question because we're rolling into the to the end of our our, our sweet wow. chariot <laughs> of Afro. Okay. So let, let, let me just let me just uh, add this into what we were talking about uh, because I've run into this with a lot of authors. If you want people to see your stuff, you have to be brave. Mm -hmm. You can't be scared to walk up to Linda Addison when you see her walking down the street and be scared to say, here, I want, here's my, here's what I wrote. Do you mind looking at it? Because two of the writers who are on this call right now kicked in the Black Panther Tales of Wakanda door and said, here's my story. I want you to do this. Glenn and Danny and both kicked the door down and said, I'm going to be in this book. While other writers may have sat back and said, well, I'll wait and see if I get a call. I'll wait and see what happens. Other writers take the chance. And that's the one thing that we're always, we're always afraid of making ourselves vulnerable and having somebody tell us you're not good enough. Sometimes you just got to put yourself out there and walk up to Spike Lee walking down the street or walk up to, um, to like I said, to a Linda or walk up to uh, anyone you see and that can help you and say, I'm willing to do the work. Here's the work that I'm doing. You can't just say, I want to be, you want to say, here it is. Can you look at it? All right. And I, I, I would just say, I want to just jump on that little, that little box. I will say this, being prepared. Cause if you stay ready, you don't have to get ready. What they had was already completed stories. They wrote the hell out of those stories. They sent those stories in. And if they was bad, guess what? They would have been rejected. So they had to go through three levels of critique. Jesse, Titan books, Marvel. Yep. So and you then stay. back to Jesse. And then back to Jesse. And then back so to Jesse. Four. So you, you have to, you, if you get, stay ready, you don't have to get ready. Okay, that's my Memphis coming out. Stay ready. You don't have to get ready because you, when the door of opportunity swings open for you, you are ready to run through with your head held high, prepared. So that's one thing for sure. You have to be ready. Yeah, and when I work with um, people that um, I'm mentoring, I at some point have the, are you, are you willing to be great conversation? Because you gotta, you, you know, you gotta love and think your, your work is, as good as you can make it and awesome. Otherwise, how you expect somebody else to read it and be like, yeah, I want to publish this. If you send it in with your head down and you just got to, you know, and then the second thing I, I, I talk to is I often get the, well, it's not good enough to send it to the New Yorker. And I was like, you don't get to self-reject. You get to send it out. And if it comes back, you just send it out again, unless you can make it better. And, it, and, and they're like, yeah, I'm afraid. I'm like, it's okay, you can be afraid. Emotion and, and how you behave are two different things. You can be afraid and still send it out. So I'm a hard person to work with, but you know what? Some of the people I've worked with are doing beyond incredible right now. And I couldn't be happy about that. You gotta be brave. Um, that's one of the main things about it. You gotta be brave. Um, I'm, I, as an indie publisher, um, an indie writer, you know, I wrote my stuff. Um, I just automatically assumed that everybody wasn't going to like it, but um, I would find enough people that like it <laughs> that I could actually sell it. And as far as connecting with people, what uh, Jesse was talking about, uh, Linda's a perfect example of that. Um, I, I met Linda online. I actually read her first story. The first story I read by Linda was in Dark Matter. 
And um, when I ran into her online, I had just written my first book, and my, actually my second book. And I said, hey, Linda, you know, didn't really know that. Well, I said, hey, Linda, would you read this book? And if you like it, will you write me an intro? And she read it and she liked it and she wrote the intro. It's, it's the same way I met Charles Saunders. You know, um, I, I was um, probably too naive to, to know any better or <laughs> to think that it, anyway, but I was like, I had something I was passionate about. Um, I had a conversation and I was hoping that they would like it. And if they didn't want to read it, I'd say, okay, I wasn't going to take it personally. You know, I was, that's what they, they may not have the time or something like that. But um, I teach a class um, um, once a year on self-publishing. And um, one of the first things I tell people when you go into, it applies to self-publishing and also, and also applies to publishing in general these days, is that when you decide to self-publish, you decide to go into business. That's basically what you're doing. And uh, you have to decide whether or not you want to be a business person because everything you do, you got to do yourself. You know, this is your passion. And the goal is not to try to, um, to write like other people want you to write. The goal is to write what you're passionate about and find people that are just, about, just as passionate about it as you are. That's basically what it comes down to. Yes, I wanted to jump in, in here to, to um, piggyback off of that. He's absolutely right. I think that the mistake that a lot of young authors make is that they think that they're supposed to write what's popular, write what other people want to write. That's not it. You're, there is no such thing as a book that every single person will like equally across the board. So when you think of it in those terms, when you go after an audience, what you're actually looking for is that pocket of, of like, I'm the same as you guys. I grew up a nerd. I was, I remember I was in elementary school and they used to call me book girl, which was very unoriginal, but they would do that because I was literally like Belle from Disney. I was walking down the hallway reading a book. And so what I found out as I got older is I need to find other people who were book girl. I needed to find other people who were walking down the hallway reading a book, you know, in like seventh grade or whatever. So what you're doing is, is finding that collection, that tribe of people, and that's how you're able to make your work distinct from other uh, authors, from other genres. It's not about pleasing everybody. It's about finding that thing that you really like a whole bunch and saying, okay, well, let me see. I think there might be other people who think this is just as interesting as I do. Um, and then you go out there and you go find those people. Just like they said, don't be afraid to network. It's not so much that you're trying to sell someone a book. You're talking about your experiences. You're talking about the stories that are really important to you and connecting with other people. And that's what is going to allow you to find an audience and to continue writing if that's, that's what you want to do. So it's, it's not really trying to sell to anybody. It's just meeting those people, networking, building a community, and just understanding that you guys are all in that same space. And that's where you all want to be. And, and also, another thing I want to bring up that Linda mentioned is I think mentoring is really, really important because a lot of us are able to be where we are because someone else helped us. So you have to remember that you're, everybody's on a ladder and you have a personal responsibility to reach down to that rung under you and help somebody else up. Don't pull that ladder up behind you. You need to help other people. And that's what a lot of us uh, um, like to do in, in our free time or in professional lives as well. Can I add uh, one more thing to like um, one other thing, um, as far as like, you know, tribe, you know, like hit those cons, you know, um, go online, um, take advantage of um, like all their, like all of the uh, like groups on Facebook, Black, uh, Black uh, Society of Science Fiction, like any place, like when you see people that are gathered together and talking about or like doing um, the thing that um, you want to do. I would also like to say, as far as writing goes, I think one other thing is um, like writers, like don't be afraid to write badly. Because I think a lot of people, I know I thought this, I thought like if you have an idea and when you sit down and start writing, it's supposed to come out, it's supposed to be good. And a lot of, and I think a lot of people, well, I'm not gonna say a lot of people, but I think sometimes writers sit down and when they start trying to write, it's not good, it's terrible and they get discouraged. But um, I think one thing to realize is like the average story, probably between the time a person writes it and the time that it's published, they probably went through it at least 50 times. You know, that's like, uh, and that's, I think that's a, a modest number of like re rewriting a story like about 50 times, um, you know, and that's like maybe write one page 50 times, you know, to get it right. So, you know, don't, don't be afraid to put in that time and don't be afraid to write it, even though it's not feeling good when you're writing it, even though it feels like you're just 
like just um you know going through trash like keep going you know and and just go back and go through it again pretty much say i just want to add on the idea of mentors also i was just to say i re we always remember our we remember our good teachers right remember the teachers that are so important to us and i just want to say that i had a few teachers in different stages of my development who actually encouraged me to write the work that i wanted to write um they they want appreciated creative writing. They recognize that it wasn't an easy thing. I think sometimes when people teach literature, they we get to thinking that the, the person observing the dance is more, more amazing and powerful than the person who does the dance. And actually creative writing is extremely challenging to do. So the fact that you're able to study Octavia Butler or Emily Browning or, you know, <laughs> Edgar Allan Poe or whatever, you know, who are no, you know, they're no longer with us. It, they, they still had to work tremendously hard to create the work that's now part of the canon. And to create fiction is no, no walk in the park. And it, it requires you to use a, multiple, a multitude of skills and bodies of knowledge in order to do that effectively. So I will say the teachers who encourage creative writing and who recognize that speculative fiction and genre is a valid, powerful literary tool for exploration on so many levels, they are, they are the real heroes. Um, so if you find those, those mentors, I mean, I remember being, after I did Dark Matter, being asked to MFA programs by students, by graduate students, right, so that I could support their actual thesis because the people who were at the universities where they had paid $30,000 or had teacher assistantships at that were worth thirty dollars and $40,000 um, didn't feel qualified to read their work. Um, because it was science fiction or fantasy or what have you, or didn't think it was a valid genre. Now everything you can think of is science fiction and fantasy. Even the, the most literary work with a capital L, all of the award-winning work is science fiction, right? I'm thinking of, of you know, some of the, are, you know, just uh, from Louisiana, Maurice uh, Carlos Ruffin, speculative novel, you know, um, and, and you could just move on and on. So please encourage your students um, to write the work that, that is the, the work that sings to them, the work that demands that, that it be written and to treat it with as much respect as you would anything else because so many scientists actually read that genre and are inspired by it. Um, Octavia Butler has a landing pad named after her on Mars because those scientists at NASA love and adore her work and respected her perseverance and her um, determination to be a science fiction writer when she, like Linda, didn't have any visible models at the time that she was aware of. So absolutely, I just wanted to say that. I'm gonna say everywhere I am because I think it's important um, to build in that new work that we nurture it in the classroom and in the spaces where it's happening. Thank you. I wanna highlight real quick, Jesse just put the, the, the true and the true in, in the comment. You mm -hmm. know, I'm in, fifth, I've been in 50, anthologies with 10 more that I can't talk about that are coming out. How do you think that happened? I'm, it's not just because I'm like so good. I am good, but I ain't that good. What a lot of it had to do with in the very beginning in particular is going to conventions, sitting on in the audience on panels, talking after the panels, talking to people and saying, I would like to find out more about that. I want to find out how to get into that. And, you know, being willing to be rejected because you know what I also say? Rejections don't kill you. If they did, then, you know, that's one that you're done with already, <laughs> so, you know, so I, I just wanted to say what um, Jesse put in there is really the, the whole um, ball of wax, along with re rewriting and editing, but, you know, that's another story. All right, so audience, if you have questions. Oh, Glenn, go ahead, Glenn, and then if you have questions, go just ahead. Add on. You know, I, I don't have any background in um, uh, uh, fine arts or English composition, uh, but I had um, ideas that I thought other people might like. So first drafts, you can have a thousand first drafts, you know, keep trying to make them better, ask for help. But, um, you know, uh, my, my uh, greatest admiration to Kyoko and uh, Milton and uh, Cerise Rennie Murphy, for example, you know, these are people who treat the um, writing and publishing uh, work as a business. If you treat it as a hobby, it's going to be a hobby. If you treat it as a business, you're going to get better. You're going to learn. I want to thank um, you all so, for coming yes. um, to Diller. Thank you so much, Diller, for hosting us um, for the Black Panther Tales of Wakanda anthology that dropped on March the 9th. Um, this is our first um, official event. 
um, with the public. Yay, Linda has her book. Um, it is a beautiful, beautiful book. Um, if, like I said, it's going to take you all through Wakanda, all the different characters you love, um, T'Challa, T'Swuntu, um, um, the earliest, the earliest Black Panther, um, Bashinga, um, as well as um, Shuri, Okoye, all kinds of other characters, um, Killmonger <laughs> as well. Um, Tanana Ribdu wrote a beautiful story, The Queen, The Return of the Queen. Uh, we just have some amazing um, works in here. The book is beautiful and I'm really picky about books. So I, when I got it, I said, uh oh, uh oh, somebody brought it this time. It's just, it's very, very well designed. Um, it looks um, ancient and future at the same time. And of course, um, our dear Black Panther looks like he's leaping right off the page. So I just, I love that effect. Um, if you have any questions or anything, you can always reach out to any of these writers. Um, we are online, we're on social media, um, and we will be around doing more events, um, hopefully reading. There's going to be an audio book, right, Jesse? Yeah, there's going to be an audio book. Um, if you can unmute Jesse, that would be great. We're waiting to see who voices those audio books. <laughs> wow, that, I mean, that's going to be exciting, right? There's a few lines I can't wait to hear dramatized. <laughs> um, and Shuri, uh, we are honored at Dillard University to have all of you. What a wonderful series of conversations. And oh my God, the way everybody expressed Afrofuturism, the opening lines you read, oh, I, I can't wait to hold mine in my hands and read the whole thing. Thank you all. <laughs> Thank you, thank you. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Um, one way you can support this book is by word of mouth. So we we're talking about if you're your own author, I think I put it in the comments. Word of mouth is so important for books. Um, tell a friend, tell someone um, that you found this book, that you enjoyed it. Um, rate it, review it online if you can. Um, put it on your own blog. All these things really help extend the footprint for a book and build that um, reader community that's so vital to that process. Um, if you are a writer, sit down and write your Black Panther story now. <laughs> Stay ready so you don't have to get ready. <laughs> Kick that um, door down. Yeah, knock that door down, be ready. Also, I will just say I'm uh, co-editing, guest editing um, with uh, uh, Danny and Daryl, Jerry and Danielle L. Littlefield, um, who attend, uh, graduated from Xavier uh, College. Um, we are doing a special HBCU, HBCU issue of Obsidian um, that the deadline has been extended to March 22nd. So we are seeking original short fiction and poetry um, from um, alum or current students and current faculty or um, um, former faculty of HBCUs for this very special issue. It would be wonderful to have Dillard University represented. So um, send us your work um, and your scholarship as well that, and visual art and music, right? It's Obsidian Lit. Um, um, Obsidian has been around since 1975. As you already know, I also edit I'm the 10th editor, the new editor of the magazine of fantasy and science fiction. Um, so in their 72 year history, I'm the first person of color period <laughs> to edit. So um, again, send your original short fiction and poetry that is of course, speculative fiction, science fiction, fantasy, and a little horror, and maybe the things that are hard to define as well. Thank you all so much. Hope you enjoy the collection. Um, we'll be out and about. Um, I know in Memphis we sign books and I'll be sending my copy around so I can get it signed by my fellow contributors. Um, so excited. Um, thank you all so much. Yay. Thanks, Sheree. <laughs> Wakanda thank forever. <laughs> I just wanted to say a couple of words. I'm so sorry that that happened with the noise, but I guess it's technology is, is technology. But I wanted to thank Mo Mona Lisa. I'm Kim McMillan. And I help with this event. And I want to thank Mona Lisa Saloy for allowing us to be at Dillard University and for Jesse for having the courage and the fortitude to write such a beautiful book. And for Sherry for just doing a marvelous job. And Glenn and Milton and Kiyoko. 
um, and Linda and Danian, you all were just magnificent. Seeing you here makes me feel even stronger that Afrofuturism is the way for us to really create black literature, speculative li literature in the future, and it's wonderful. And you all have proven that to me so much today. Thank you for, I'm honored to even be a part of this. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Kim. Uh, Sheree and-, and Okay, Jess excellent. Oh, yeah, I did, I'm, 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 I was muted. Hey, um, be well. Um, may you all be safe wherever you are. Um, may the light uh, shine on you. And um, I hope that you enjoyed this time together. Thank you for carving out this time in your day. Um, Black Panther, Tales of Wakanda, edited by Jesse J. Holland. Um, yes, celebrate. Um, it's a two year journey to get this book published and we really appreciate you, Jesse. Thank you, woo. <laughs> and I wanna quickly thank all, all of these writers who took time out of their, their busy schedules. Instead of writing, they were here. So I wanna say thank you to all of them. Thank you to Dillard University. Thank you to Kim. Thank you to Mona Lisa. I appreciate everything you, you're doing. If you haven't bought your copy of Black Panther Tales of Wakanda, go to the Dillard Bookstore. You can get a physical copy of it there. You can also order it online and from your other favorite independent Black bookstores. Also, for those of you who are audiobook fans, the audible copy of Black Panther Tales of Wakanda will be available next week with an audio CD coming out in June. So go out and support the book. If you want to see more works like this, we have to support the works that are already out. All of these writers you see on screen have their own books already out right now. Go to Amazon, go everywhere else where they those writers are and support this work. You can't get more unless you support the ones that are already out. So thank you for everyone for being here tonight. I really appreciate it. Yay. Thank you, Jesse. Thank you all. Goodbye. Awesome.